My name is Natalie Mara. I'm the Executive Director of the Ontario Health Coalition. Sal, I just took took on your role here, sorry. So welcome, this is a press conference about um, the court challenge to the Ford government um, issuing a new 30-year license and expansion for Orchard Villa, which is owned by Southbridge, a for-profit chain with one of the worst records in the pandemic and Orchard Villa, which had a you know just a, a, a horrific history of inadequate care and death uh, in their long-term care home. Um, so I'm just going to open and um, tell you the where, what, when, who of the court case and what's happening this week, and then I'm going to introduce you to Kathy Parks, who's um, from the families of Orchard Villa, whose dad died, I'm sorry, Kathy, in um, Orchard Villa. And then Stephen Schreiman, our lawyer, is going to come in for a few minutes and will be available to answer questions. Um, obviously, the court, he's going to argue the case before the court and um, not in the media. And so he'll be able to answer some questions, but he's not going to speak too much um, just now. So um, I'm going to go ahead and then we'll open it up for questions and answers from the media. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead. So this is a court case in which um, that will be heard before the Ontario Divisional Court tomorrow, Thursday, um, at 10 a.m. at Osgood, uh, courtroom three. So it's Osgood at the corner of Queen and University for the media who would be going uh, or the public. It's open to the public and it's in courtroom three starting at 10 a.m. tomorrow. The Ontario Divisional Court will hear our case, which is to, to have the uh, license, um, which has been provisionally given to um, Southbridge to expand Orchard Villa, which is a 233 bed long-term care home in Pickering um, to expand it by 88 bed beds. So it will be more than 330 bed home. Um, sorry, 300 and yeah, 330. It'll be a 330 bed home, sorry, um, uh, if the license goes through. So it's an expansion and a new 30 year license. Um, the reason we brought the case is that under the long term care legislation, including the legislation passed by the Ford government, the Fixing Long Term Care Act of 2021, um, the director uh, in the in the ministry is not able to issue a new license to a long-term care owner who has a poor history of substandard care, non-compliance with the standards expected for long-term care, um, and who's run um, their homes in or home in a manner that is prejudicial to the safety and welfare of the residents. Without question, Southbridge at Orchard Villa and in their other homes is in that category. Southbridge had one of the highest death rates in the pandemic uh, of any of the for-profit corporations. And the for-profits, as we know, had much higher death rates than the nonprofits and the publicly owned homes. Southbridge contracts out the running of their homes to extend a care and um, Orchard Villa was found to be perilously short staffed in the pandemic. The military was sent into the home. The military found conditions like bare mattresses without bed linens that residents were lying on. Mattresses put on the floor so that re elderly residents couldn't stand up and walk in order to you know, essentially restrain them from being able to walk. Walkers and other objects that they need put out of the reach of residents so they couldn't get them. There were flies and cockroaches present. There was the smell of rotting food, trays of rotting food piled up in residents' rooms. Um, residents who were severely dehydrated and malnourished, um, you know, all kinds of equipment that wasn't available from um, suction equipment to oxygen. Um, there was, they had to order a deep clean of the home. It cost half a million dollars to deep clean the home. It was, you know, one of the very worst homes in Ontario. After the military left, continual inspection reports show substandard care at Orchard Villa. 
this home, the government has gone to extraordinary lengths in order to push through the expansion and new license. The city of Pickering voted unanimously against their application for zoning for the expansion um, and um, the province issued an MZO overriding the unanimous opposition of the city of Pickering uh, to issuing a new license. And under that zoning order, ultimately, they will be able to expand up to three 15 story buildings, more than 800 long-term care beds and more than 600 retirement home beds in that facility. This for a company with one of the very worst records of substandard care, negligence, neglect, horror and death in their facility. Um, and so we brought it to court and said, you know, you can't pass a piece of legislation through the Ontario legislature that requires a standard to be upheld by the ministry and then completely ignore it. These protections were put into legislation in order to protect the public, the public interests, the residents of um, long-term care, and they matter. Uh, and so we're asking the court to quash the license and um, we're hoping um, that that will be successful. The um, hearing will be before three judges on Thursday um, and uh, and um, the uh, it's being brought by the Ontario Health Coalition in partnership with Kathy Parks, daughter of a deceased resident and part of the um, families of Orchard Villa. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy. Thank you. Um, yes, my dad was uh, a resident of Orchard Villa for approximately six months. Um, unfortunately, he was there during the uh, wave one of the pandemic, and he was not allowed to have any of us um, with him when he passed away, and the conditions surrounding his death were very traumatic for my family and myself, and I'm, this is just one story of so many um, not even just during the pandemic, but when you look at the inspection reports to see what's been going on in Orchard Villa, um, there's been so many things that have gone wrong. And I can't help but come back to, you know, May of 2020 and watching our premier um, visibly upset in an interview saying that he will hold these homes accountable and that there will be accountability. At the time, myself and the other family members really held on to that as, as a as a branch of hope. And then here we are nearly five years later after after all of these deaths. And instead of that, we have 30 year license, 88 extra beds with the potential to over 800, um, zero accountability, concerns from the government in Pickering, the municipal government. And we have repeatedly been saying and when I say we, I'm talking about the family members of Orchard Villa. Um, although my name is on this, I know that I have their backing. We've discussed these things at length. And we've been very public and very open and not just the families, but actually the public in Pickering. We've attended um, public, public meetings that the government held to talk about these licenses, to talk about an MZO. We've been very clear that this was not wanted. Um, and yet, despite that, the response that we've been getting from members of the government is, well, we're doing this in the public's interest. And we're doing this because there need to be more beds. There's never a doubt that there needs to be more beds, it, it, but it has to come with a quality of care. Just saying we need more beds is not a, a, a final statement. There's an end to that. Because creating more beds without the quality of care is simply creating more horrific ways for more people to die. And I think that when we look at the history of, of Orchard Villa prior to the pandemic, and even since the pandemic, you can see that there's been failure after failure. And I, I fail to see why and how this government can grant this to them and override everything, the families, the public, the government, municipal government, and just continue on this path. Uh, without really dealing with the quality and without really giving any kind of answers for what's happened for people like my father. Um, I think the fact that the families of Orchard Villa are still united in this and still talking about this shows you that we haven't forgotten. And we don't want this to happen to anybody else. It really needs, there needs to be a change. Um, I also want to say that, you know, when we come down to how this is being built, this is being built with our money, taxpayers' money. 
And so we do get to have a say, we should get to have a say in how this home is built in the quality of care that our, our loved ones are receiving. And so this idea that it's being done in the public interest, um, when you've asked the public and they've shared their interests, they've shared their ideas, they've shared their thoughts, and then you've ignored it anyhow, to me, that's a problem. And I have you know other family members that are aging and uh, it's terrifying to think of what their future would be in a place uh, like what my father went through. It's just something that I, I can't, it, it still keeps me awake at night. And we're still dealing with the grief and the trauma of what happened to my father, as are many other family members throughout Ontario, really. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah. And um, just in just a moment, our lawyer, Stephen Schreiman, will be coming down to answer questions. I just wanted to make a note that um, since the pandemic, so this was not the pandemic and the military report were not an aberration for Orchard Villa. It is a continual um, approach to profit taking and care that has con that started from the time that Southbridge acquired the home and has continued to date. Um, and even in the recent inspection reports from the years after the pandemic has abated somewhat, um, you can see the same types of um, critical incidents, um, uh, notices for them not meeting standards and so on that were found in the pandemic, including failures of infection, um, control practices, including failures to assess residents who'd fall in and get them to the hospital and monitor them, including, you know, failures to provide supplies and medication management and all, you know, the full range of um, care and protections that the residents are supposed to have in the home. Um, and so, um, with that, I'm just going to text Stephen and see where he is at and uh, open it up for questions. Yeah, if there's any questions uh, for us, while we wait for Stephen. For yeah, the media. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say for folks on the Zoom who wish to ask a question, please uh, indicate in the chat that you wish to ask a question. Uh, you just need to put your name and your publication, and then we'll call on you to ask a question. And then for the folks that are in person, um, feel free to raise your hand and um, the speakers will call on you. I just want to make sure we're accurately, I guess, explaining what happened to your father. Is, did he pass away because of COVID or was it because of neglect or what's, I guess, the best way to describe it? Um, the best way that I would describe it was uh, neglect, okay. dehydration, uh, lack of food. He was COVID positive. Okay. Um, I never had a chance to go to the hospital. So at the time, I was actually asking for him to be sent to the hospital, and that request was denied. And so, but it would be accurate to say, I guess, he was one of the 70 people who they he say died, died of COVID. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And it was more than 70. At one point they were saying 80 yeah. and then they dropped it down to near 70. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, there's all right. Another clarifying one just on the extension of the license. Is it has the license been extended or is it up for extension right now? It's not an extension, it's an undertaking to issue a license. Okay. And so when that happens, um, the company goes to the bank, borrows the money, and begins the construction project. So the undertaking is critical in terms of putting in place the funding regime, the public funding regime that the Southbridge depends upon in order to build and operate this one. So the undertaking is given by the government, so by the ministry to the corporation to start moving ahead with that. Okay, so is it accurate to say the government has improved what they're doing at this moment, or is it still, that's what I'm trying to do, just because for radio, it's yeah, so very it's, short. So it's, it's actually an undertaking, Okay, and it's issued by a director of the Ministry of Long-Term Care, so he's the official responsible for making the decision. There's certain funding that's advanced as soon as the, or very soon after the undertaking, taking is given, including capital grants, 
uh, to cover the entire cost of the project, but nevertheless in the millions of dollars. And so that money flows quite quickly. There's a development agreement that's signed. It was signed before the undertaking was issued in this case. Um, and there is a funding which engenders a funding agreement and funding commitments and there are policies that, and, and a, a general funding regime that then comes into play. I think colloquially we can call it like provisional approval to move ahead with the license. Provisional approval, like it's not a well, legal. Not, okay, we, okay. So our, I'm just trying to figure it. I guess just in terms of what the legal yeah. characterization of this is, is, you would say it is a conditional approval. Correct. Okay. But but if the conditions are satisfied, the license issues. And as a practical matter, once the undertaking is given something in the vicinity of 80, 90, 100 million dollars is spent on building the homes. And then at that point, it's expected to see that it uh, complies with the agreement the company entered into with the, with, with, with the ministry and the license issues. So that's, that's the process. But you take the undertaking to the bank. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, but based off of what you were just mentioning, it is a conditional approval, um, which, if I understood correctly, includes like um, conditions that, like, Portugal maintain a certain standard of compliance, um, I believe, uh, uh, to like the provincial act. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, if they do maintain compliance um, and, uh, you know, are issued that license to you. They need to have lingering concerns about their ability to, even after opening up um, and continuing onward to maintain that standard of care. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll let Nat, uh, I'll, I'll let Natalie or, or Kathy answer that, but let me just say that our characterization of the approval is conditional. I think what the, what the government is saying is it's preliminary. Okay, so that's one of the issues that's in dispute. Uh, in respect of the proceeding tomorrow. Um, but um, what it is, is an undertaking that has conditions attached to it. And the act states that if you comply with conditions, uh, a license issue. So there's a big debate about, is it preliminary, is it conditional? What did the director have to do before issuing the undertaking? We say, well, the act is very clear. I don't want to argue the case in the media, and 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 they say, well, no, it doesn't really have to be done now. It'll be done later. Or this is some of the in the weeds debate we're going to have about the law and what it requires tomorrow. In our view, this is clearly a conditional license, and um, and we'll see what the court has to say about it. So, from from our point of view, obviously, waiting till they issue the final license for thirty years is too late. Then to be able to stop it the home would be built the you know we wouldn't be able to undo it at that point um and so we're in this catch-22 either you wait till it's too late and then they argue well you know you've got to stop a home that's already been built um or you know is well on its way to being built um or um we do it now and the fact is that um orchard villa has off you know southbridge has owned that home since 2015 it has an unbroken record of non-compliance and poor care, inadequate care, inadequate standards since 2015. What more do we need? I mean, if you if if you were to issue a license to Southbridge for Orchard Villa, what could a company possibly do that would be so egregious that the you know the province of Ontario would actually deny them a license? Because what could be worse? Than you know what has happened in Orchard Villa, the things that the military found, the things that the inspectors have found, the experiences of the families, the you know experience of the hospital when the when the residents were finally admitted to the hospital with kidney failure, anorexic, malnourished. I mean, what what would you possibly have to do to meet 
you know, the, the act says that poor, you know, companies who are bad players, bad actors should not be getting long-term care licenses in Ontario. That was for a purpose that was put in legislation, passed by the Ontario legislature for a purpose that fits with the morals and ethics of Ontarians. Um, and this simply does not. And the question should be really for the Ford government, why on earth would they issue a license? We're paying for those beds whether they're built by Southbridge or someone else, we're paying for those beds, the public is paying. Why on earth would we give this 30 years uh, at a massive expansion to such a company with such a record? Um, yeah, yeah, and sorry. I think too, that when you, when you talk about, you know, what if they need compliance, then will everything be okay? Um, there's a concern certainly that when somebody's looking, everything is shined up properly. And then when no one's looking, it reverts back to what it was. So the only thing we can really look at is the history, how they've done it so far. And when you take a look at the inspection reports, and this is after wave one, after all of these deaths, and you continue to see the failures in infection prevention and control, you know, improper use of restraints, um, there's just a whole host of things that, that prove even after the worst, they still continue to fail in certain areas. So how can we have faith that that would be carried on for the 30 year license. There's no faith there. We have to go on what we know and what we know is not good. Just to follow up if I can. Um, so I know you raised concerns about South, South Bridge as the owner of the home. Um, and my understanding is that the province's condition is that they can't um, hire an, uh, well, extended care um, as a management company anymore. So um, I guess I'm just curious about where, like, where you see the responsibility primarily with, um, like, I guess, where does the responsibility from extended care stop and Southbridge start? Southbridge is the license holder. Was the license holder is the license holder. If that license holder then decides, as it did, to contract out the management and operations of their homes to another for-profit company, and then both companies are taking profit out of that home and running it in a way that, in which the care is completely inadequate, in which the staffing is completely inadequate, in which the conditions of living are horrific for the residents. Well, the license holder is accountable. And, um, you know, there have been issues in a number of Southbridge's homes. And as I say, Southbridge had among the very worst, it had the highest rate of deaths um, of any of the for-profit corporations in the pandemic, um, far higher than even its for-profit peers. Um, and so, you know, they have to bear some accountability for what's happened and all of the lives and all of the suffering. Any other questions? Other logistical question on my end. Just can you take us through the timeline of how this is all going to go here? And as I know, you probably don't know exactly when it's going to end. I don't know if it's a decision or if I can you just take us through the timeline of yeah, how this is all going to play out or it should play out, I guess. Yeah. So when we um we filed in January. So I think the question is what happens from, from here. Yes, yeah. So, that is yeah. So we have a hearing tomorrow and then the court will take whatever time is required to render a decision. There's no way to predict how long that will be. Okay. Is there a standard? I don't know. I think they have a performance standard of many months, but, but I, I'm not sure. But we, we would expect a decision in a few months. I think it'll take some time. There's a 7,000 page record. Uh, there's some there are legal issues that haven't been ever uh, litigated before in terms of you know how the licensing provisions of this act apply. So it's it's new terrain and it raises several issues, including issues related to the charter. And so there's a fair bit of there are a number of substantive issues here that they're going to take very seriously, obviously, and it will take some time to resolve it. It's a three-person panel, so there are four, three judges. They will either agree or they may, may be a dissent. Those are the only parameters around this that I can uh, describe at this point. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't know if you can hear that on the uh, on the Zoom. If you heard Stephen. 
um, but it's being heard tomorrow by a panel of three judges, and then it'll take a few months to get the ruling. Okay, so I just wanted to end, like the political context here is that Ontario, um, the Ford government has promised repeatedly to build between 30 and 45,000 long-term care um, beds. That so far, the majority of the licenses that they have um, been moving forward have been to this for-profit companies, and in fact, the same chain companies as were responsible for the lion's share of deaths in the pandemic and long-term care and were exposed for terrible conditions and terrible behavior. This is not this is not a necessity in Saskatchewan, for example. They the provincial government stopped the contract with extended care for the extended care homes after they were exposed for um, horrific conditions in um, their homes and they repatriated them. They made them public again. Um, Ontario built four fast track long-term care homes during the pandemic on hospital grounds that were nonprofit um, in, in partnership with the public hospitals. Um, and we have a whole array of public uh, municipally owned and not for profit long term care homes. So, um, you know, there are other options that are available that are in the real world that are e even being used. Um, and uh, and the question we think for the Ford government, the political question is why would you move ahead with giving the next generation of long term care to these companies to own and control after everything that we've seen that should have really been its own never again? Well, it's not been successful. Uh, what does that do to Ford government? The Ford government? Yeah, I mean, yeah, to, yeah, to their decision, not, not for me. Yeah. So that would it would quash. We're asking that the court would quash the license um, approval for Orchard Villa, and I would, you know, at that point, um, we would hope then that the ministry would have to take seriously its obligations. The government would have to take seriously its obligation to. Um, uh, follow the law, which says that they cannot issue new licenses to companies that have horrific records for care. So they have to figure out another way. Now, as I say, we're paying for the beds, whether they're built for profit or not for profit. In fact, the for profits are not giving us free beds. They're taking profit every year for 30 years out of those homes. Um, so we're paying for them anyway. And our argument from the Ontario Health Coalition is build them as public and not-for-profit homes that are owned and operated in the public interest and not for someone's profit. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stephen has to run because it's he's getting ready for the trial. All good? Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone online. Bye now.